and say, look, look mega, learn mega more events, from your failures and from your successes. Specifically, in some ways, this has some resonance. Let's talk about heroes. It's 1854, and within a few square blocks of London, people start dying mysteriously. And within 10 days, 500 people have died, and nobody can figure out why. So, meet Jon Snow, the real Jon Snow. <laughs> He's a doctor, and he convinces local officials to remove the handle from the Broad Street water pump. Now, why would he do this, and how would he do this? Snow took a map of the area, and he made a small black mark where every death occurred. By doing this, he was able to show local officials that the closer people lived to that water pump, the higher the household death rate. Jon Snow had identified the worst cholera epidemic to ever hit the nation, and he had identified the source of that epidemic, the water pump, and he ended it using data visualization. Snow was a hero because he could effectively communicate his data. Now it's 1855, and Britain and France are battling Russia in the Crimean War. And of the two million soldiers, more than half have died, but it's not the guns and the bombs that are killing them. Meet Florence Nightingale. She's a nurse, a statistician, and a social reformer. And she convinces Britain to take funds away from weapons right in the middle of the war, and spend them instead on better health care. Now, why would she do this, and how? Nightingale illustrated the soldiers' mortality data, and she used blue-gray to show all of the deaths that were due to preventable disease. By doing this, Britain government could see, as you can, that it wasn't the Russians that were killing their soldiers. It was preventable disease and poor health care. So, Nightingale got her hospital built, and as a result, the death rate dropped to a fraction of what it had been. Nightingale was a hero because she could effectively communicate data. Now, we've talked about some data heroes, but what about times when that data use doesn't go so well? Well, another case widely written about takes us to 1986, when seven U.S. crew members board the Challenger space shuttle. Now, there had been concerns beforehand about how the booster rocket's O-rings would function. And the O-ring is a seal that prevents hot pressurized gases from escaping and coming into contact with other areas of the shuttle. So to investigate these concerns, the Challenger engineers and supervisors looked at diagrams like this about O-ring performance, and they looked at charts like this to help them with their judgment on whether or not they should launch the following day. But did they get the information they needed? Because personally, I find these to be unclear. Well, the engineers still had some concerns, but the ultimate decision was to go ahead and launch the Challenger the following day. So the seven crew members boarded, the Challenger space shuttle launched, and within 73 seconds, it exploded, killing all seven crew members. Now, many speculate this tragedy did not have to happen. Remember those charts that they looked at the day before? Well, several data design experts have since redrawn these charts to make them more clear. For example, I could take away the unnecessary information, and I could add clearer labels 
so that you can tell we're looking at the number of failed launches that occurred at each temperature. But still, nothing quite jumps out at me. And that's because there's some important data that was missing from this chart. Now, you can see all of the times where there was one failed launch, two failed launches, three failed launches at each temperature. But what about the 17 cases where the launch was successful? That data was missing from this chart. So let's go ahead and add it. I've put it here in green, and you can instantly see something that all successful launches had in common. They all occurred when the temperature was 66 degrees or above. Now you can clearly see that with the exception of a few outliers, it was probably safest to launch on a warm day and probably not a good idea to launch on a cold day. Now when the Challenger space shuttle launched, it followed this same trend and it was 31 degrees Fahrenheit, so cold that it doesn't even fit on the graph. Now from this chart, you could probably have decided not to launch that space shuttle. But remember those charts that the Challenger engineers and supervisors were viewing. Many speculate that if the data had been effectively communicated, the tragedy might have been avoided. So we've talked about when data communication has gone well and not so well. This brings us to the main differentiator between the two, and that's design. Design is what allows us to communicate data so that it can be understood. And this is where my research comes in. A couple of years ago, I conducted a quantitative study into how high-stakes data is being used by teachers and other educators. See, when we teachers use data, it helps to inform decisions we make on behalf of our kids, our students. And when we understand the data, we can find out information to better target each kid's specific needs as long as we understand the data. But what if we don't? What if this is what I understood from the data, yet this is what's really going on? What if this student actually struggles with word analysis, and that's why it seems like she can't read? And maybe she's trying really hard, but she struggles with a learning disability. And maybe she wants to come to school, but she has some health problems that are preventing her. Even if I use multiple measures and my own insight as an educator, if I continue to misunderstand the data I view, I can be treating problems that aren't really there and completely overlooking problems that are there. And that would mean that I could not be giving this student the best care that she deserves. Now, research is conclusive that nearly all teachers use data to help kids. But it's also conclusive that in most cases, they are misunderstanding the data. They only understand less than half of it that they're using to make decisions to impact kids. So how can this be? We can't blame teachers because on average, they're intelligent, they're well-educated, they're caring. I'm an educator. We don't want to blame educators. Rather, <laughs> right? <laughs> Rather, they're no more to blame than the challenger team that couldn't pull vital data out of poor data displays. Because if intelligent people can't understand data, something's wrong with the way the data is being shown to them. And I wanted to solve this problem, but how? Well, around this time, my daughter got sick with the flu. And it wasn't serious. She didn't need to go to the hospital. She didn't need a doctor. But she did need medicine. 
So I went to the pharmacy and I looked at over-the-counter medicine. And I could very easily figure out what medicine would best help my daughter with her symptoms. The reason is, over-the-counter medicine has key components in place that help you know how to use the product and that help the product work as it's intended to work. For example, content. If I gave my daughter medicine that contained nothing but sugar and food coloring, that's not going to help her with her flu. And the label is important. It lets me know if this product is for a cold flu versus a stomach flu. And it lets me know how much of the medicine my daughter should take and how often and what are possible side effects I should look out for. And of course, the package and display helps me. If there's a picture of a kid on the package, I can guess it's probably meant for a kid because that would be too misleading to have that product meant for an adult. And if there's information I need that doesn't fit in the label, I can get it from supplemental documentation that's tucked in the package. And if that's not enough, I can always go online and find a help system. WebMD is used by 50 million people per year, and that's only one online help tool where I can search for answers to my medical questions. So I thought about these five components that helped with over-the-counter medicine. And I thought of the term over-the-counter, which means the product can be used without the help of an expert because components are in place to help you use it properly. And it occurred to me, we need the same thing for data. So I started studying this concept. I studied how vital data report content is to the value of the data. And I studied how we can best label our data, such as with better titles and with footers under the display that guide us in understanding the data and avoiding common mistakes. Okay, I studied packaging, how we can best display data so that the design actively encourages correct analyses. And I studied supplemental documentation, like a reference guide that can walk the user through how to use the data. And I also looked at how a help system can be embedded directly in a data system so the user gets help using the technology, but also gets help using data in general. And it turned out I was on to something with this. So I published a set of data reporting standards that are a synthesis of over 300 different studies and other expert sources from a variety of fields on how we can best communicate data so that it's understood. There are labeling standards. For example, a footer should not exceed 328 characters or else people will just disregard it altogether. And there are package and display standards, such as the need to use two-dimensional graphs, because 3D graphs can actually skew viewers' perception of data values. And there are standards for all of those other over-the-counter components we've talked about. But I wanted more evidence. So I tested these standards in a quantitative study with 211 educators of varied backgrounds and varied roles. And I found that the least effective of these data reporting standards doubled participants' understanding of the data. Other standards tripled their understanding. And other standards caused participants to understand four times as much data as they otherwise would. Now, I tested these standards in isolation to isolate the variables, but conceivably, you could make data over the counter in all the ways possible to make it so that it is easily understood and no chance of misunderstanding. And these are being used because it's the lives affected by data use that we care most about. Metro Nashville Public Schools is one school district in Tennessee. It affects 82,000 students. South Dakota's Department of Education 
houses the data of 150,000 students. And Illuminate Education is just one EdTech data systems company, and it houses 5 million students' records, mainly in the US, but in other countries as well. Each of these single entities is applying some of those standards to making data over the counter for the educators who use the data systems. And each of these single entities impacts thousands of students' lives. Now, I wrote these standards with the field of education in mind, but they also have implications for any data where it's pertinent that people understand the data. And my hope is that researchers will continually be exploring how we can best show these numbers to people so that they're understood. So we've talked about data heroes and times when data use didn't go so well. We understand that design is the key differentiator, and we understand that there are guidelines we can follow so that the data is understood. But how will this all come together? How will we get to a point where powerful data is being communicated in a responsible way? The key is building people's ability to leverage design when communicating information. If we look at just a sampling of wonderful data displays, we begin to see varied design at play. Design is like a language with its own vocabulary, and technology allows us to use this language more than ever before. So we need to know what design options are available to us, and we need to know those best practices for making data over the counter. Because when we can visualize our information, and when we can make it over the counter for those who use it, we can express important ideas and important information across geographic boundaries, across language barriers, cultural barriers, economic barriers, across virtually any obstacle in our path. We cannot cut art and design from students' education. We need to embed it in everything they're learning. Because when our data matters, it matters that we make that data over the counter so those who use it can easily understand it. Because just like medicine, data really can affect lives. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.